So like I said, I'm gonna go over just a, the first handful of slides we're gonna go over really quick because I think it's covered, you know, just some of the vocabulary. And we're gonna really focus on calorimetry because that's what I was told in the notes to give to this guest speaker. Like as I mentioned, for those who came in late, the guest speaker, uh, he called, I mean, he called and left a message like at 10.30, 11 o'clock this morning. So I apologize that this may not be the best that you have, but that way you don't fall in, you know, any further behind uh, within respect to this chapter. And so Dr. Duncan had just told me that he was wanting the guest speaker to cover calorimetry, like a closed calorimeter versus an open calorimeter. And so that's why, in specific, that's why I'm going to focus most of today's lecture on, but I just want to briefly talk a little bit about enthalpy, which I know that's a, that was the letter H. So I think a lot of that was already covered. <clears throat> So state function, all that means is usually you don't have, um, here actually you might just go, let's skip all this, blah, 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 blah. All right, so state functions, what that means is you don't know the path with which you got there, literally, but it depends upon the amount of substance you have. Volume, for example, is a state function, right? One liter is different than having two liters. So it changes. Whether there are certain physical properties, like boiling point and melting point, which actually I don't think is covered until Jenkin too, but that doesn't depend upon the amount you have. The boiling point of pure water for one teaspoon is the same as the boiling point of pure water for a gallon. Okay. And so, however, here for state function, it just depends from the initial versus the final state. And enthalpy and energy were some of these, like I said, I'm pretty sure the newer edition uses the letter U for inter internal energy, but if not, you know, E can also be used as well. <clears throat> Work. In the notes I'd seen had mentioned like enthalpy. Enthalpy is just uh, a state function. If it's under constant pressure, which usually for the thing, especially for those who are in medicine, almost everything in your body is all at one pressure. This stuff in the lab, it's not like the lab room all of a sudden is fluctuating the pressure. And so we can then simplify enthalpy to say the enthalpy is heat. And so that's where they talked about heat of combustion and the heat of work. So since pressure is not changing, then enthalpy ultimately just becomes equal to, to heat. They use the letter, little, the lowercase q for heat, okay? And so there are different types of heats. The heat of combustion is probably the one you guys have talked about the most. But there are different types of heat of reactions. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> That's from, like I said, I copied and pasted this from a previous year's. They had asked me a question if they could bring donuts to the class, which I don't know if Dr. Duncan will let you bring donuts to class or not, but I always tell the students that they could, but that's just up to do it. Don't, don't. That's, that's the reason why donuts suddenly appeared in the middle of the. That was from a pre. Okay, you probably use the term endothermic and exothermic. Remember, what is endothermic? If something is endothermic, where's the heat going? It's going towards, the energy's flowing, you know, the heat's going towards it, it's coming in. If it's exothermic, it's giving off heat, it gets hot. Then this is the really, the big uh, issue that people may have sometimes with respect to it, is the sign. It's kind of confusing because you have to think about the sign. Like, is it a positive sign or is it a negative sign? It's not like you can have a negative heat per se, but it's all the sign has to do with respect to the system. If the heat is flowing into, then it was positive. You know, you get a positive sign. And you think back to algebra or calculus, this is really has to do with the absolute value. Um, so the whole idea is the sign is relative, but it's the value that's important. If it's leaving, if it's exothermic, which a lot of the reactions like heat of combustion, those are exothermic, then the sign is going to be negative, okay? Because heat's being lost by that system. And that's really important in a moment when we get to calorimetry. So, just briefly, enthalpy is an extensive property. So the delta H for it in the forward direction is going to be equal, but in the opposite sign if you go backwards. Okay, so that's why if you're making something, it may be a positive 10, say for example, but if you go to break it down, it'd be negative 10. Once again, it all has to do with respect to uh, 
the with respect to its relationship to the system and the reaction depends on the state of the products and the state of the reactant. So that's why the delta H is going to be different for water vapor than it would be for liquid water versus ice. Okay. All right. I'm not going to go over that part. So this is why I really wanted to focus on and spend the most amount of time on because this is why he told me that he was wanting the guest speaker to talk about, which was calorimetry. Calorimetry is just a process that's used because it's practically impossible for you to get to understand the internal energy of a system it's very difficult okay i don't know if anyone has any snacks in here but if you are if you're looking at like what is a calorie what are what are calories besides something that many of us including myself try to avoid sometimes but what, what does it mean if something has 100 calories it's energy okay and so there has to be a way and we're gonna actually i made up an example hopefully that works out but briefly, th th they actually use calorimeters to determine the amount of calories in, 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 the, you know, in food. They use, you can use calorimetry to determine like unknown substances, how pure or how impure something could be, things like that. Because you're, what you're doing is you're measuring that internal energy of um, something. And the whole idea by measuring whether or not heat is gained or lost with respect to the surroundings. So that brings me to a couple of just generic terms. One's heat capacity, and one is specific heat. Okay, specific heat is just an abbreviation for saying specific heat capacity. I don't, I, I would think your book would probably use both of them, and they use them interchangeably. <clears throat> so this is just a little generic, uh, you know, vocab that you will want to make sure that you write down and, and understand. All right, all that heat capacity is, is how much energy is it going to take to raise the temperature of something by one degree Kelvin or one degree Celsius, depending upon the units that you're using. Okay. And then specific heat capacity, which is the one that gets used probably even more often in, especially biologically when we talk about it, is the amount of energy requi required to raise the temperature of one gram of something by one degree Kelvin or one degree Celsius. Once again, one degree Kelvin, if you think way, way, way back, probably like the first or second chapter, one degree Kelvin difference and one degree Celsius difference is the same. Kelvin is just the absolute temperature, whereas Celsius is relative to water. <clears throat> okay. And also, early on, when you're probably learning units and stuff, just because they tend to throw these interchangeably, we have the units for energy. You can have it in either joules or you can have it in calories. I will let you know that the term calorie on food is actually kilocalories. They just don't want to really scare you by saying that those snack wells, a hundred calorie, you know, pack is really a hundred thousand calories. And so that's why food calories is usually with a capital C, which is actually a thousand, you know, one kilocalories. <clears throat> and one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. One food calorie would be equal to 4.184 kilojoules um, I'll whenever we work out an example later on I'll go through and I'll write that stuff down for you and that way give everyone a chance to work it out as well So there are two types of calorimetry. Okay, there's one. One is called a bomb calorimeter, which is not nearly as exciting as what it sounds. And then there's one that is a constant uh, pressure calorimeter. You can actually take the specific heat and mathematically, we're talking about the heat transferred, which is Q. And I really hate the fact that they use, I can't change this, but they use the X. That's not like algebra X, it just literally means times. So that's mass. So you divide it by mass, divide it by temperature change, which is more 
So if we cross multiply, what it would come out to be is S M delta T is equal to Q. Okay. Which that one, that form is more user friendly, I would say, than the other one. Because many times, you know the specific heat of a substance. You may know the mass, and you measure the, the delta T and the calorimeter, and so that way you can figure out the energy. Or what you could also do is actually figure out each calorimeter has a function of how much. If you imagine if you just have a calorimeter that's metal filled with water and you put something in there, the metal itself, like the actual machine itself, can absorb some heat or give off some heat. And so it's called the heat capacitance of the calorimeter. If you know it, and you can figure out the energy. You can actually work backwards to also figure out the specific heat con, uh, the specific heat capacity for uh, any substance as well. <clears throat> okay, so the first type of calorimeter is constant pressure calorimetry, which literally means it's at a constant pressure. This is the one that a lot of times, and maybe in high school you did this in high school that they make the little styrofoam cup calorimeter you know you stick styrofoam cups together you stick like hot water in there and you know what the temperature of the hot water is and then you put in a substance and you measure the amount the temperature change and you can figure out either the purity of the substance i guess in theory you can figure out the mass or the heat capacity of the substance things like that okay and the reason why is that constant pressure but the volume in theory can change like you drop something in there the volume's going to raise of God in this room it's like sometimes you hear the voice of God or what could possibly be the voice of God <clears throat> so that's constant pressure and for a constant pressure calorimeter it's literally just what I said before. Q is equal to the mass times the specific heat of whatever that substance is times delta T. And since the pressure is constant, this is equal to delta H. Sometimes I'd forget to point that out when I taught Jin Kim and for lab, if you do a lab on this. I forget to specifically say, since pressure, once again, don't forget that since pressure is not changing, then heat is directly related to delta H. So that's one type, and we'll do examples of problems with it in a moment. But then we have a second type of calorimeter. Okay. The second type is one that's at constant volume. They call it the bomb, the bomb calorimetry. Like I said, it's not nearly as exciting as what it sounds. It's bomb calorimetry. It's carried out in, in, a, in something that's sealed, so therefore the volume cannot change. So anything that fluctuates, like any heat that's given off, can't affect the volume. It can only be absorbed by the substance that's on the inside of the, the calorimeter itself. <clears throat> this is the one that is used most often to determine the caloric intake of foods. Okay. And so, since the volume is constant, what you're actually measuring directly is the change in internal energy. And like I said, some books use delta E, some use delta U. So I apologize if your current book uses a different letter than this one. It's supposed to be a capital U. But once again, it's a direct, direct way to look at the internal energy of something. Whereas with the one that's constant pressure, you're looking at the heat. But this one's actual internal energy, which is why they like to use it for, as for, to do, to look at the cal number of calories in the food because the only thing that you're really looking at is the actual energy content. <clears throat> Usually, this reaction is very, very 
very small. And I didn't write down the equation for it the, on the PowerPoint, but the equation for it is Q. Of course, we're, once we're talking about the transfer of the heat here, is equal to negative. This time it has a negative sign because you're looking at it leaving the system directly, so it's negative. Then I'm going to call it capital C, C A L, which what that is, that's the heat capacitance of the calorimeter itself. Or what's on the inside of the calorimeter which can be measured if you have a no, the way that they do this is first, if a company first buys a bomb calorimeter, they first have to calibrate it to determine what this, this unit is right here. So they take something that has a known energy, they burn it, they combust it inside the bomb, and by, based off of that, they can figure out what this is. And then this doesn't change for the calorimeter, so then you can have it from then on out. I assume that they probably periodically retest it and recalibrate it, I should say. All right, so it's Q is equal to negative the capacitance of the calorimeter itself times delta T, the temperature change. So since we're talking about the fact that energy is leaving the system, it's going to be, um, the temperature should be raised if it's a combustion reaction, right? That means you're burning something, so the water that's on the inside of that calorimeter should be increasing. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll give everybody a moment to write down that equation as well, since I didn't put it on the next slide. Okay. So I'll give you a moment to read the problem. I couldn't find a good example in the books I had in my office. <clears throat> okay, you got to figure out, first of all, how many calories will be on the serving system required by law. You know, to put the little label, the informational label on the back. <clears throat> so what we do is we sip this off. We have it analyzed in a bomb calorimeter. The hardest part with these types of reactions, at least, is to know which of the two equations to use. Okay, and so the way to do that is if it's a bomb, if it says bomb calorimeter or if it says constant volume, you have to make sure you use the equation for the heat capacity, um, the Q for the constant volume calorimeter. Later on, I'll try to also do an example of one that uses where it's not, where it says it's a constant pressure. That's like a, or a styrofoam cup type of calorimeter. <clears throat> so that's set up just a little bit differently. So what you do is you send off a small sample. For example, this is three grams of these cookies or whatever. You stick it in the bomb calorimeter, you combust it, and you're given that the heat capacity of the calorimeter itself, so that right there is going to be capital, I forgot what letter I used before, capital C, C-A-L, okay. That's supposed to be C-A-L. I don't have the best handwriting. But there it is. So that's what that is. And then we have the temperature. This was T1, or initial T is 25 degrees Celsius. The final one is 32.5, degrees Celsius. Okay. But it says how many calories are there in 100 grams of a serving? So it's assuming, because let's face it, three, who's gonna sit there and eat three tiny grams of some type of dessert? Okay. So what it would be if it was in a 100 gram serving of this dessert? So there are a couple things to point out. Almost always, not always, but many times, here, let's go to this one. Many times, heat capacities are given in joules, but if you're doing this for food, you're gonna, you, people don't, unless you're internationally, like in Europe or someplace like that, many times here in the States, they don't give the nutritional value in joules, we give it in calories. So we're gonna have to ultimately convert joules to calories. <clears throat> And another thing, caveat, is we start off here with three grams 
which is not what a real serving is. It's asking what would be in the 100 gram serving. So let's, 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 let's combat this with a couple of different ways. Okay, so first of all, let's write out what we know. We know it's in a closed, uh, not closed, well, it's a closed system where it's a constant volume calorimeter. So it's Q is equal to negative C cal delta T. So that'd be the equation that we're gonna be using. We're also told that C cal is equal to 7.794 kilojoules per degrees Celsius. <coughs> Finally, we're told that the initial temperature was 25 degrees Celsius, and the final temperature was 32.15 degrees Celsius. And all of this had to do, remember this was, all this information that was given to us was for three grams, a three gram, I don't wanna say serving, that's the wrong term, but a three gram sample, when we're wanting to find out what it is in a hundred gram servings. And we need to convert this all to calories. And food calories, which once again, one food calorie would be equal to four point, one eight four joules killed joules i'm sorry so that would be something that i that would be given because that's just a known fact so one food calorie which is a capital c is equal to 4.184 some books may say like 4.183 whatever but roughly it's the same kilojoules remember a kilo of course means a thousand Okay, so now we get to do the mathematician's favorite game, plug and chug. So I'm gonna call it Q of 3.00, so that way just to remind myself, because sometimes I've even forgotten that this is not the heat for the entire sample. Dr. Duncan may not put, do that, or you don't even have to do that, but I know that sometimes I would get in my haste, I would move on and think that well, I've answered the question whenever I hadn't is equal to negative 7.794 kilojoules per degree Celsius. And you can figure up the delta T right here. Of course, delta T is gonna be equal to T final minus T initial, which is what, 7.15? Once again, I don't have my calculator out, so you definitely want to check my calculations. <clears throat> That's supposed to be a one. And don't forget to uh, sign in before you leave if you came in a little late. Okay. All right. It's coming up. Okay. <coughs> now we want to make sure that the units make sense. Okay? So we have a degree Celsius on the bottom and a degree Celsius on the top. So therefore, the only thing left are kilojoules, which makes sense since this is an energy. So here, the Q, not G, that's supposed to be Q, for three grams. It's gonna, and then it's gonna be, be a negative number. But once again, that's just to show you the direction of the heat flow. It's not really like if you eat these cookies or whatever, you're gonna miraculously lose calories. Okay, so if only. Okay.
You know, it's not like celery. Yes, celery does have calories, but you know, the whole idea is that your body takes more work for it to break down because of all the fiber content. And teach over here that said teach all the, the, the pre med, the upper level science classes and biochemistry. So if you hear, oh, it's got negative calories, well, technically it doesn't have negative calories. It just takes you a lot longer to try to get out of your system. All right, that's supposed to be a negative sign. It came up as a big squiggle. <clears throat> And I, mean, I wrote down an answer, but I better check this to make sure. I know I've got a cal. Where is my calculator on this thing? There it is. All right, so we've got seven point seven nine four times. 7.15. Technically, it's negative, but once again, it's what? 55.73. Once again, that's kilojoules. And we have to keep in mind that that's for three grams only. But the question was said, like, if we make a hundred gram, you know, little bag of whatever these cookies or whatever are, you know, how many calories ultimately would we be consuming? <clears throat> And so, what we are going to do is we say, all right, we've got 55. Now we can, I'm going to ignore the negative sign here because once again, we're just, we're not worried about the directionality. I'm worried about how many calories are in that bag of cookies if I can justify myself eating that bag of cookies, which actually I can't have sugar, so I can't eat those cookies in the first place, but that's beside the point. In an ideal world, we have 55.73 kilojoules for every three grams. So then, which there's nothing on the bottom here, you can put one, there, there's nothing on that bottom. How many kilojoules are going to be in 100 grams? You always wanna make sure that the units cancel correctly. So we have grams on the bottom, we have grams on the top. So the only thing left would be kilojoules, which is an energy, so that's good. All is well there. And if you wanted to, I didn't put it down, but this would be Q, like Q for 100 grams. <clears throat> Definitely check my math on this next one. Oh, whoops. There we go. When I did it before, I got 1.8, because mine's in scientific notation. So 1.85 seven seven times ten to the power three kilojoules which would be one two three what like eighteen fifty seven point seven or so joules uh kilojoules if it's not i'm sorry kilojoules if it's not in scientific notation Alrighty, so we're almost there. That was how many, that, that is the energy content for one serving of these cookies. It's just not in calories, which for those for Americans like us, we can't figure it out in kilojoules, like how good or bad that that would be. So this computer program lets me move everything up. The miracles of modern technology. Okay, so now let's figure out what it would be in and if you notice up here, once again, I said that one food calorie is equal to 4.184 kilojoules. So this becomes fairly simple. We just take 1.8577 times 10 to the power 3 kilojoules. We know that kilojoules has to go on the bottom. And calories, food calories, goes on the top. And I know that because I, wanted, I want to get rid of the kilojoules, right? And so one food calorie, one food calorie is actually equal to 4.184 kilojoules. And I'm not sure how you learned or how um, Dr. Duncan shows you to do. This is called dimensional analysis. It's just a fancy term that they give in chemistry books like around, around chapter one or two. It's just a way to cancel units. This is the way that I learned.
Just remember, you multiply by everything that's on the top, you divide by everything on the bottom. Instead of using slashes, you can use parentheses. It's, it's, all, it's all the same. But just to make sure the units cancel, we have a kilojoules on the bottom, we have kilojoules on the top. We will multiply, of course, this number well, by one, and then we divide it by 4.184. <clears throat> Please double check my math because I get roughly, and you may have some a little different due to the rounding differences, but I get 444 calories. And that would be calories in 100 grams of the cookies or whatever. Like I said, I did that pretty quick. Did anybody else get that right around that same number, 440-ish? All right, awesome. So it tells you how many calories would be in 100 grams of those cookies. So that's the way that they use a bomb calorimeter, or one of the ways that they use a bomb calorimeter. One of the practical ways that's used, I should say, for those in biology and biomedical fields is to look at like the energy content of food. <clears throat> okay, so now what I'm gonna do is unfortunately, I don't have a good example already typed up, so I have to use it often old quizzes and exams of how to use a closed calorimeter. Too bad this isn't like the lab where I can just stick it under there and it automatically show it up on the, no, there's not a camera on the ceiling. <clears throat> so now we're gonna use a closed, uh, an, an open system, I'm sorry, one that's at a constant pressure. Remember the hardest, one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing in calorimetry is to understand which of the two equations overall do I need to use. Do we use one that's for constant pressure, which sometimes is called an open system, or do you use a bomb calorimeter, which is a constant volume, okay? Um, you know, the, the, the two equations are slightly different with respect to each other, and so that's the hardest part. So on this one, what it is, is that, let me make sure that I don't. Okay, so like I said, this is off of an old quiz or exam that I gave. And it said 45.0 grams of an unknown substance. Okay. That is one hundred is at one hundred degrees Celsius. And this is placed I apologize if my grammar starts to get really poor since I'm trying to write Ooh, Don't want to do that as we do it. No, we do. In a constant pressure calorimeter. Whoops. Okay. Okay. Containing. So this would be like your styrofoam cup. 75 grams of water. And the water is at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. And the way that they do this is they would literally take... Here, we've taken the hot object. Let's say they do this sometimes with unknown metals. Like if you get a sample and you don't know what metal it is, this is something, if, if it's pure or even if it's a mixture, you can kind of figure out, you heat it up, and the way that we would do it in the lab is we would literally take the metal, you stick it in boiling water for several minutes to where the metal itself gets hot, the same temperature, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Then you immediately take it out and you stick it in cool, a cool water in, that's in your calorimeter. You have to let it set until it reaches equilibrium. That's the important thing. You've got to let you measure the temperature until the temperature no longer changes. So it's at equilibrium. Okay. So the temperature at equilibrium. So the temperature of the calorimeter at equilibrium. So it's no longer changing. Is 33.5 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> now, you would, in order to do this, you need to know 
specific heat. Because if you remember, this the generic one for constant pressure is Q is equal to S, which was the specific heat, times the mass, times the delta T. All right, so here, the question is saying, now, if the specific heat of water is 4.184, which by the way, that's, that's where we get the calorie. The calorie is based off of water, the specific heat of water. 4.184 joules per grams degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat <laughs> What happened there? Sorry. For whatever reason my pin stopped working. Specific heat of the unknown substance. And the bond calorimeter, the, con the contents of the bond calorimeter could not increase, right? Because the volume fits. Here they could inside that styrofoam cup. And so what we have to remember is that the Q of the system, which are the, or the, of the calorimeter itself, has to equal whatever is leaving the unknown substance. I'm going to call it the Q unknown. It's just they're going to be an opposite sign. So it doesn't matter which Q you call negative. Right? Because the amount of energy that's leaving one has to equal the amount of energy that's entering the other and vice versa. So they're going to have opposite signs. Which that's... But we'll see that in just a moment. So what I would always tell students to do, even if... it seems kind of redundant is I, you know, some people can just look at that and, and, and go, but I would make a table of everything. So we're going to have a table for the water, which technically is called the surroundings. If you think back to the old, the beginning of the chapter, probably talk about surroundings versus system. We have a table for the water and we have the table for the unknown, which I'm just going to call you. Maybe it's probably a bad choice. You in. Okay, for unknown. These are the things that we need to know. We need to know S, we need to know M, we need to know delta T, which really is T final minus T initial. Those are the, like that's a table. Some of them are just given to you and some of it's not necessarily directly given to you. Okay, first of all, it says what is the specific heat of the unknown substance? That's what we're trying to find. But we are given the specific heat for water. It's 4.184 joules per grams degrees Celsius. We're given the mass for both. The mass for the water was 75 grams. Whoops, there wasn't a zero, point zero in there earlier. If I don't know if Dr. Duncan's really specific on, on um, significant figures or not. But in the original problem, I didn't have a zero in there. And the second one, the unknown, it said it was 45. And that one did have a zero in it. <clears throat> then we need to know the... I'm going to skip the TF for right now. We're going to need to know the, the initial temperature. The initial temperature of the water, of the water in the calorie under, what was that? 25 degrees. And that's where I've seen sometimes people make mistakes as they get this mixed up. What was the initial temperature of the unknown? The initial temperature. It was 100 degrees. Okay. The T final, which I forgot to see. I did tell you what that T final was, didn't I? Did I tell you that what the T final was at equilibrium? Did it say the temperature at the equilibrium was 33.5? Good, because I can't see it on my screen. So I was hoping you guys had written it down. All right. So that means that's the T final for both. 
33.5 degrees Celsius and 33.5 degrees Celsius. So then I used to have students go ahead and make a delta T for each one of these. And so for water, it's always T final minus T initial. Okay, so that's going to, going to be 8.5. But here for the unknown, T final was 33.5. 33.5. So it's going to be the opposite sign. Oops, I think. Oh, sorry about that. So it's going to be 33.5 T final minus 100. So I say it doesn't really matter which one on that original equation up here. One of these is going to be negative, and so it's going to ultimately get rid of the, the negative on the other side. <clears throat> okay, and so that is, in my head, is what, 67? 66.5? Okay. So, and it's going to be negative. So, I'm going to have to squirrel everything up again. Oh, it left the 66.5 behind. There we go. So just as I said before, the Q of the system, Q of surroundings, whatever you want to call it, one of the Qs. In fact, let's forget about just getting confused with the vocabulary. Let's call it the Q of water has to be equal to the Q of the unknown, but they're just going to be opposite signs. So I'm going to call it negative. It doesn't matter. You could have called the other one negative because ultimately... The two negatives, you know, a negative and a negative, whether you multiply or divide, it's going to become positive. <clears throat> now we just plug and chug. S, M, and what I suggest that you, what I would always tell students to do is, I don't know why he keeps leaving the 66 behind, is do the algebra first, because I've seen people make mistakes as entering something into their calculator. If they try to do each one, and so therefore they may lose partial credit just because. So what I mean by do the algebra first is the Q of we have for water, S M delta T is equal to the opposite S M delta T for the unknown. So what we're trying to do is just get this right here by itself. So remember from algebra, all we have to do is we need to divide both sides by everything else. So what I mean by that is we're just going to, here I'll change colors. We're going to divide both sides by negative. You know, M delta T, and that's M of the unknown, delta T of the unknown. Negative M of the unknown, delta T of the unknown. So by doing that, this cancels, this cancels, and the negative cancels. So I'm just going to rewrite it to make it look prettier. We have, and then I'll put the W's in for the water. We have the specific heat of the water, water, times the mass of the water, times the delta T of the water, divided by the negative 1, technically, times the mass of the unknown substance times the delta T of the unknown substance. But if you remember, the negative from the unknown delta T and the negative one would cancel each other out. That's why it's not that, not that important. And just because I'm running out of time, what I would get, oh, yes, I know I've got it, class, thank you. Mm -hmm. Was the number that I got whenever I did this ended up being 0 0.89 joules per grams delta C. Okay, because and the reason why was this was 4.184 times 75 times the delta T of the of the water, which was about 8.5. The two negatives cancel each other out, so then you divide it by 45 and divide it by 66.5. Okay. All right, so 
I'm going to just quickly go ahead and in class with prayer and I want to